We are underway here at The Glenn Show. This is Glenn Lowry of The Glenn Show, bloggingheads.tv, substack.glennlowry.substack.com, and YouTube forward slash C forward slash Glenn Lowry Show. I'm with John McWhorter, my bi-weekly conversation partner, my friend, professor at Columbia University. I'm professor at Brown University. We're the black guys. And we're back. John, author of Woke Racism, how a new religion has betrayed new black religion America. religion has betrayed black America. Got it, man. I got it. I got the <laughs> subtitle. John is everywhere. John was on The View. John is on uh, NPR. John is uh, being interviewed by... John was the, Morning um, Joe. The to, John was the answer to a question on Jeopardy the other day. Which Goodness. Which tickled me pink. That is I was, great. I was, they didn't get it, but still, they put me what on the list. The question? I was, or what was the answer to which you were the question? Um, what Columbia professor wrote woke what what Columbia linguist wrote woke racism? How and a new the, religion? The category was books or something like that. Was famous profs? I was so flattered. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know because I don't watch Jeopardy, but you know you hear Believe about me, it. Me, a lot of people watch Jeopardy. It comes on at 7.30 Eastern time in my part of the world, and, and I check it out every now and then when People the basketball game yeah. doesn't, doesn't come on early. <laughs> I was drinking a gin and tonic and talking to somebody, and all of a sudden I could see it on social media. So, Congratulations. yeah, it was fun. So, yeah, that happened anyway. So Okay, so how are you doing? Um, how is woke ra racism doing? I'm, uh, I expect to see you on the New York Times bestseller list and whatnot. It did, it did get there. And what I'm actually... You're, you're I'm very, slightly out of the frame, by the way, please. Oh, I was yeah. very tickled that um, the audio book is also on the list, too. And so you are, are reading the audio book? People, yeah, and I read it, and people are listening to it as much as they're reading it. I'm, this, this works for me. It's nice to write a book and to have people read it and listen to it. That's all I ask. So, yeah, this is good. I caught, we're talking about John's book, Woke Racism, which is just out and it's making him tired having to go around and do a lot of book promotional interviews and stuff. I caught mm -hmm. one of them with Nathan Robinson, the, uh, the podcaster, and uh, he asked you two questions that I've always wanted to ask you. Question number mm -hmm. one was, aren't you doing a, a great disservice to religion by your analogy or your metaphor of uh, what you don't like about woke racism being a manifestation of a religion as if ipso facto being religious was irrational or bad, mm -hmm. uh, to which I'm sure you have a very good answer. Uh, and then mm -hmm. the other, other thing that uh, Robinson said that I thought was interesting, I hadn't quite thought of it that way, was he says, we're mad at the people who want to change, let's say, the math curriculum in the state of Oregon or California to be more, in, quote unquote, inclusive, acting as if mathematics doesn't have correct and objectively determinate answers to questions and that it's kind of like what community you grew up in is going to influence the way in which logic works. And we reject that categorically. And therefore, we think this is an excess of woke racism. And Robinson says, no, no, no. It's really teachers trying to address the question of how different communities perform differently at mathematics, trying to be sensitive to some of the psychological barriers kids might have to learning mathematics. And trying to be, as it were, quote unquote, more welcoming or open to those kids who may have blocks, psychological barriers or whatever that prevent them from being able to succeed. So it's just, you know, they might be wrong in what they're trying to do, but what they're trying to do is not an attack on reason. It's, it's an effort to address a, a real subject, a real objective uh, social problem. So mm -hmm. I, I thought those were decent criticisms, John. Well, it's very simple. If you actually read the documents about race and math, you see that it is not a matter of there are different ways to the same mountaintop. We have to just understand that there are certain kids who are going to be brought to that mountaintop in a different way. There is a philosophical questioning of the entire epistemology that mathematics is based on. And every now and then there are interludes where if you read them and you're interested in finding them, it looks like they're saying that they're not saying anything radical. But the point is, why would they write the pamphlet if they didn't have something really radical and different, let's not even say radical, but different to say. And if you look at all of the things that are said in, for example, that document, things that are spelled out very clearly, it's impossible to come away from it not seeing that there is an idea that to be a black person, especially, is to be somebody where it is too much to expect 
that math can be imparted in the old way. And more to the point, the idea is that to be black is to be someone for whom it is too much to expect that you're going to indulge to the same extent in getting the exact answer and explaining what that answer is when somebody asks you what it is in the way that it's considered to be normal for essentially all other kids. That's what the document is. And the idea that someone like me is exaggerating, I guess, for some sort of you know nefarious purpose on that simply okay. isn't the case. You have to read the, um, the document. So the issue yeah. is what's really the driving uh, worldview of these educators? And you don't think Robinson is correct in saying that it's mainly they believe in math, just like you and I believe in math. They're just trying to reach these kids who have a difficult time entering into math. You think that their worldview is really they don't believe in uh, uh, their their relativistic postmodern uh, kind of uh, rejecting the uh, centered uh, kind of foundations of you know Western uh, intellectual achievement. It's, or, it's you know. painfully clear if if you actually read the document. And it really is painful. It goes way back. It's not as if somebody came up with this sort of thing sometime in, in 2020 or 2019. This is a long tradition of questioning the idea that black kids are, quote unquote, linear thinkers. That's actually something that I've seen in documents that go back to the late 70s. Questioning the whole idea of the, the precision that's required in something like math. And then there's this whole general idea that you're seeing in the air and I think it's our responsibility to look at things in the air and try to synthesize what the general philosophical yeah. underpinnings are. That, for example, there can be a physics where this is Chandra Prescott Weinstein, who is a brilliant person. But the idea that black women in physics are going to make a different kind of contribution where things along the lines of intuition or holistic thought will be considered as important as the nasty mathematics that are involved in physics, that there are different ways of approaching physics alongside the other. And we can pretend that they're equal, but one of those things takes a whole lot more training and, frankly, effort than the other. And Chandra Prescott Weinstein, from all that I know, does real physics. I'm not knocking her, but she has this idea that there's this other kind of physics that needs to be let in in order for physics not to be racist. That's cut from the same cloth as this. Okay, that, let me try this on you. Let me try this on you, John. I'm thinking about Stefan Alexander. Stefan Alexander is my colleague, a physicist, a theoretical physicist, and he's professor here at Brown. He's a former president of the National Association of Black Physicists. Um, he has a PhD from Brown, a BA from Haverford. Uh, he was a professor at Dartmouth College uh, and then came back here to Brown, where he's been a professor for, I don't know, five years or so a uh, full professor of physics, uh, runs a lab, uh, gets big grants. He's a real theoretical physicist, writes about cosmology early, the physics of the very, very early universe, you know, the first few seconds after the Big Bang and all that kind of stuff. So he's a real, he's a real physicist. He has two popular trade books out. One of them is called The Jazz of Physics. And... He's a jazz musician on the side, plays the uh, alto saxophone and does it very well. Um, and uh, it's about improvisation uh, in the creative process of theorizing. Okay, you know, and uh, he's drawing analogy. I mean, he's not saying physics is jazz or that jazz is physics, but he's saying as a jazz musician, there's some interesting connections. And he explores them in his book, The Jazz of Physics. These are books published by, I don't know, Basic, or some kind of, you know, real publishing house. Mm -hmm. The most recent book, which has just come out, I'm going to have him on the show to talk about it as soon as we can get our schedules together, is called Fear of a Black Universe. And it's about dark matter and dark energy, which if you're a physicist, you know what they are. And if you're not, you don't. But it's basically like when you study the movements of galaxies, it looks like there must be more matter out there. If you believe in Einstein, if you believe in the theory of rel relativity and whatnot, you cannot account for what you're observing, but to stipulate that there's more matter in uh, the universe than what you can actually see with your eyes. Okay, so this is dark matter and dark energy likewise uh, is something that has to be posited to exist in order to make the equations work given the observations of the universe. That's uh, that physicists don't understand. Mm -hmm. So uh, to make a long story short, 
this guy argues that uh, any scientific community has a tendency to close and to reaffirm what it is that they know and to be resistant to innovative ideas that will change the way that you look at the world. Um, it will show that the theories in hand are either incomplete or in some ways or another wrong and require to be revised, extended, in some cases thrown over altogether. Einstein being a prime example of this kind of revolutionary theoretical innovation. And mm -hmm. he says, these communities are social structures. Now, he's not talking about race as such, but he's talking about conformity to the system as we come to understand it. And that outsiders, now he is talking about race, people who come in from the outside are less confined by this closed way of thinking and more able to stand apart from the consensus and try to defend a new idea. He says, as a black physicist, his experience has been similar to this that he's describing in general. But he points out that many of the uh, Clerk Maxwell, for example, or Einstein himself were outsiders when they began their theoretical innovations. And so he makes a case, a kind of social case for diversity in the scientific community uh, built on the logic that I've just got through outlining. And, and I wonder if that moves you in any way to think a little bit differently about the people who want to diversify and be more inclusive in, the, in mathematics and the sciences. That was a question. All I would say is that if there's going to be that kind of diverse perspective, and I'm familiar with that, that makes perfect sense. As long as the different way of looking at it is couched on the same level as what has been said before, as long as the diverse perspective is not one that requires, for example, that if we're talking about physics, that the math not be as hard with a <laughs> stipulation that part of advancing is to eschew what really takes hard brow wrinkling thought and that yeah. you need to open up to something, frankly, that's easier. I'm sorry, but that won't do. Yeah. And it doesn't make it different because it's a black person. But if you really are coming in from the outside, I, I have a little bit of that in terms of my own linguistics in a microcosmic way. And you can see that just throughout history. But there's a difference between opening up to different perspectives with the same amount of rigor and opening up to, frankly, dumbing things down and saying that that's okay because it's coming from the descendants of African slaves. I don't think that Stefan is arguing this, but that is, frankly, the sort of thing that you hear from. And you're the one who kind of apprised me of this, that there is a certain kind of person who's saying that it is wrong to expect high-level math from Black academics because you know, somehow that's not our province or you know, our schools weren't good enough that you have to allow perspectives that don't involve crunching the numbers so hard. You said that there was a certain individual who was saying that, and I'm not going to name who the individual was, but I hear the same thing, frankly, from some people in linguistics, that there's increasingly this requirement that you back up what you say with quantification. It bothers me too, because I'm not a numbers person, but to say to require the numbers is to be racist, that won't do. And you, you know, there's a movement along those lines. So there's a general current that worries me of which the quote unquote math is racist, even though that might be more a slogan than what the people would, would, would stand behind. That's part of it. And I stand behind that if you read the pamphlet in question. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, John. You know, I'm on your side with that. We did a conversation about that uh, uh, issue, I don't know, two or three months ago, four months ago. So I, I definitely agree. And, and I take your amendment, your, your uh, codicil, you know, you're prepared to enter into a diversity discussion as long as standards of technical virtuosity are not being trashed in the process. Mm -hmm. I take that very much to heart, man. I, I agree with that 100%. Uh, I could tell my own diversity story. I mean, my uh, PhD thesis, that's 1976, people. That's a long time ago. But I introduced the term social capital into popular discussion in the social sciences in that dissertation, in part because I thought that the received theory of wage inequality didn't pay enough attention to the kinds of 
social segregation and exclusionary practices that were characteristic of race experience in the United States. So that, yeah, it was true that education and work experience and uh, training and so forth were investments that yield returns over time. And you could see evidence for that in the data. But it was also true that people got information about what jobs were available through friendship networks, that they learned about the world through what was talked about around the dinner table, that they made decisions in their life in part to conform with what their peer group associates uh, thought was cool or whatever. And that in a society that was racially segregated, that meant that the opportunity to develop your human skills would depend in part upon where you were within the network of racial affiliation. It would depend upon your social capital. That was, you know, perhaps an idea motivated in part by my outsider status and my, you know, social location as a, a person of dark skin, et cetera, et cetera, in a world that was dominated by people of white skin and so forth and so on. I think something similar could be said about my former student, Roland Fryer, who has uh, came up the hard way, you know, I mean, he's got a PhD from Penn State, which is not exactly a top 10 department, although it was a perfectly solid training but he comes from a low-income background and, you know, hard knocks and stuff like that and ends up with a career, a very stellar career of achievement where the kinds of questions that he asked, you know, like the acting white phenomenon, Roland took that one on in a very serious way and produced some interesting empirical support for the hypothesis that there are social pressures on black kids to not perform well in intellectual work. It's an experience that he himself had had coming along. And uh, some of his papers on the acting white problem, I think of one in particular, co-authored with David Austin Smith. It's in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, and it's a, a theory of acting white. And it's got all kinds of game theoretic mathematical nuance and, you know, a long appendix where they prove the theorems and they, everything like that. But the core of it is if the homies that you're hanging out with don't give you esteem when you get a high achievement in the education, that makes it. A hard problem for you as to whether or not you actually realize the potential of your God-given talent because you don't want to alienate your homies. You do want to succeed in the economy, but you also want to be able to go back to the neighborhood and hang out with your buddies. And that can be a real problem. And we can, you know, take the conventional educational achievement model and, and modify it to take this effect into account. And I don't think that paper would have been written by anybody who didn't come up the way that Roland actually came up and could give other examples of that. So. That is real. I mean, yeah. definitely the diverse perspective is important. But I think many people would think about things like that and then say that you're completely out of court to dismiss the idea that you dumb a field down in the name of allowing black people in who don't like math. And so, I think that both things are true. Uh, so what does this mean practically? I think what it means is if you're a graduate department in a technical field and you're training scientists, you want to cast a very not wide net early on and maybe take some risk on people who are coming from diverse backgrounds uh, in terms of um, letting yeah. them in. But you do not, I repeat, do not, I say for a third time, don't ever soften the game for them. Don't ever lower the standard. Wide net at the beginning, but the same funneling process, the same process of winnowing oh, out good. people. Huh. And those who survive that process, who come from the diverse background, may not be proportionate to the populations in question for the obvious That's reasons. That's the problem. They're but not going to they be. Will be yeah. They will be wonderful contributors to the scientific community, in part because of the diversity that they bring. Just resist the temptation to patronize them. And, you know, that's the thing. The people who come out of that funnel, that's good. I don't know if that's old or new, but the people who come out of the funnel, it's not going to be 13%. If we're talking about black people, right. it probably and it's okay. isn't. And that's because of the ills of the past, not to mention the present. It's not going to be 13%. And that doesn't mean that your department is bigots. It doesn't mean that. If you've done your best, if you have a wide net at the top, and then see what happens with the funneling. But everybody has to deal with the same funneling, or you are patronizing and being racist in a way yourself. Yes, that is a, that is a very constructive message on these sorts of things. And the wide net... There's some people listening to this who are only going to listen to the funnel part. The wide net is very important. I've seen it. You could argue that I was part of it. I was, you know, they reached out harder for me than they did for the white kids in my linguistics program. But yeah, the funneling has to be the same or it should be the same. All right. John, I got to ask you, you were on The View. What's that like? 
Joy Behar, uh, Whoopi Goldberg. Are these real people? Or are they are they uh, like cartoon character avatars that get projected onto? The... No, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Joy. I'm oh. sorry, Whoopi. No, no. It's um, <laughs> the View is um that kind of show. It's an art in a way, and I just used the wrong word because that makes it sound like it's harder than it is. But it's a craft that you're on a show like that because you have to completely rethink what it is to communicate your ideas and. T- to be honest, I was a little off that morning. I had a lot on my mind. I did not do it as well as I wish I had. I was a little bit windy. I used my words were a little bit too big. I I, I wasn't I don't think I was as effective as I could have been. I don't think I was awful. But when you're on a show like that, the way it feels is that you walk out onto a very highly lit stage. The lights are on you. And everybody around you is in a whole lot of makeup. So often are you. And you have (laughs) what they call a long segment. We had nine minutes broken up by a commercial. And those two segments, therefore, you've got four and a half minutes. And that's like this. And if you're on The View, there are five other people. And they're going to say stuff. And they're not going to just say like a half sentence. And they're the celebrities and you aren't. So you walk onto a show like The View knowing that you're going to say three things. I had three sentences that I was ready to say. And Sonny Hostin is somebody, the woman who was sitting um, on the show to my right. Yes. I haven't seen it, but I'm imagining she would be on the right. She is known for having a certain, I hate to say it, but usual suspect take on race. And I was prepared for that. And so the first thing I said was designed to anticipate anything that type of person says. And I think that I did that well. Because the things that she did say, I felt that she was a little bit thrown because she was waiting to just say, don't you understand that racism exists? What are your propositions for the black yeah. community? Took care of that. Other than that, it was just fun. And a lot of the fun is, is during the commercial. Like I talked to Joy and we mixed it up. Whoopi and I got along very nicely. I mean, at the end of it, she said, come back on the show. She probably says that to everybody. But I felt like she liked me and we took a picture and stuff. And frankly, <laughs> it's over like that. So that's what the view is. It was, you know, there was some food in the green room. And then I went home and wrote something for the Times. But it's not discussion. It's basically you get on there and you do a little bit of kabuki. And then it's over and you hope that you sold some books. That's what the view was like. My impression of watching the nine minute segment, and it was short, uh, was that you did well. And it wasn't clear that they really kind of understood or engaged with the points that you were too, making. Too short. Yeah. It's kind of like that. But but uh, you you came out looking pretty good. So Did um, I? Because I, I really, I haven't seen it. I feel like yeah. I was there. And so one day I'll look at it. But yeah, it was just, um, I'm honored. I met Whoopi Goldberg. And so, so I have to ask you this. Did you see my segment with uh, Michael Eric Dyson at the Bill Maher? Glenn, I have been meaning to look at that and I okay. am sincere. I uh, want to see it. I wanted to know I, what you thought. So at some point you can tell me. Next next show, let's talk about it because I do want to see it. Did he let you talk? Not, like, not as much as I would have liked, but I <laughs> I look I gave him enough rope to hang himself because the brother actually is windy. And uh, with, with respect to uh, Michael Eric Dyson, uh, you know, he he's he's somewhat uh, you know, goes on and on. Uh, verbose and, uh, you know, talks in circles and says the same thing and, you know, talks way more elaborately than he needs to to get his point across. It's almost exactly the opposite of the craft that you say is required for the Whoopi Talk Goldberg about the, the, the art, right? It's artful, right? So I, yeah. I made my interventions pointed and, uh, you know, concise and, uh, you know, I played it straight. I didn't react to him. Uh, but he probably got twice as much airtime as I got, but I probably said twice as much content as he said. And the audience was with me, John. <laughs> the audience. They like uh, you? Yeah, they, they, you know how the Bill Maher audience is. They interject with applause or whatever. And, and um, I, I, did, I did quite well. All the reviews were positive that I saw. I really will watch it. I hope Dyson isn't <laughs> listening to this because of what you said, although, yes. Yes, that is what he does. Um, My and engagement I think with he, Michael was very friendly in the green room and all of that. It was. It he was has very, a good heart. Uh, very, very Mike, he's a nice guy. He does not hate people who don't think like him. I found that too, that right. in person, right. he's great. But yeah, he's hard to be on a show with because of that verbosity. I've experienced that too. And so, yeah, I'm glad that you managed to, to cut through that. 
Yeah. I don't know if we're at peak woke yet, John, but I mean, I'm talking about the Bill, Bill Maher audience now, which is a liberal audience. This is a month ago when I was on the Bill Maher show with Michael Eric Dyson. Um, the audience has left, so you expect them not especially be sympathetic to something that I might have to say, but I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure I won the audi- audience meter applause uh, measure in my encounter with Dyson. And uh, he was saying, you know, white supremacy has done us wrong and it's everywhere kind of stuff. And and they weren't necessarily buying it. So I wonder I if found, something isn't yeah. changing, if we're not in the midst of a, of, of a shift of uh, people's attitudes around the country. Well, the it's, cha- it's changing. Something is really, something is really happening because, yeah, I, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but, you know, I've been on that show twice this year and I noticed that that liberal audience did not dislike me. They seem to be interested in the sorts of things that I have to say. And there is the reception of woke racism, which is not being read anything like only by people on the right wing. And, you know, things like Jeopardy. You know, if, if yeah, somebody like us was so, you know, such a pariah, you don't, you're not the answer yeah, to a question. They wouldn't want it's the beginning to be mainstream, to <laughs> yeah. you know? And so I think that um, something is happening. And I think that we're, as I keep probably leaning out of the shot, I'm going to change my position. And I think that we're making some kind of difference in bringing things to the middle. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about that kind of thing. Now watch some horrible thing happen. But I think, I think something's shifting. Definitely. Don't you feel it? I do feel it. I do. I'm thinking about Jesse Smollett. I'm I'm thinking about uh, the. This is the Empire TV show actor, who uh, was convicted in court in Chicago recently of lying about having been attacked, a uh, racist attack that in 2019 got national attention, where he claimed that he was jumped by some Trump supporters who shouted, uh, this is MAGA country at him as they poured bleach on him, pummeled him at two o'clock in the morning when he was coming back from a subway dispensary with a How did with a they hoagie. know he was going to be there? Yeah. <laughs> Etc. cetera. <laughs> and it turns out, according to the jury and the evidence, that he, in fact, staged the whole thing and that he hired a couple of Nigerian guys to fake beating him up. And long story, we won't go into all the details. Uh, Jesse Smollett was... Uh, hailed as a victim of white supremacy during the era of Trump at the time that this alleged uh, attack took place by people who reacted, prominent people like uh, Kamala Harris and Robin Roberts of Good Morning America. I looked her up. She makes $18 million a year, John. Robin Roberts makes $18 million a year to anchor the morning show at ABC. And she had Jesse Smollett on for an interview. Uh, he cried on camera during the interview as he recounted this horrible abuse, and Robin Roberts was so sympathetic to him. And that was beautiful, Jesse, I believe is a quote from her parting words to Jesse Smollett during this interview. And they all have come up with egg on their face. And I just wonder, I mean, there's a lot here. The uh, Kim Fox, who's the district attorney in Chicago, didn't want to bring charges against Jesse at all, that even though the police had uh, had him dead to rights, that he had staged the whole thing. Um, created national controversy. It was an example of lynching. I mean, the politicians, the Maxine Waters and the Cory Bookers and the uh, whatever who could be found tweeting out, you know, this is a lynching in our time, the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortezes of the world. Um, We're all lined up behind Jesse, who was our most recent exemplar of an age-old American story of anti-Black hatred and anti-gay because he's a gay man, so it was homophobia as well as anti-black racism and whatnot. And it turns out it was a hoax, a hoax, a hoax. Now he's been convicted, I think, of five out of six charges that the Chicago PD were able to bring against him. It took a special prosecutor to bring in the Cook County court system to bring this black uh, TV star, well-connected uh, person to justice, and it awaits, he awaits sentencing as one. He also apparently perjured himself because he took the stand and repeated his story and denied that it was a hoax. And now he's been convicted on the evidence of having invented the thing. And the question of whether perjury charges will be brought is an open question. I have no expertise about whether or not that will be happening, but he could get jail time. It depends. Uh, What do you make of all of this? He fascinates me in that if I were an artist, I would do a novel. How is he going to live with himself? 
it's just, you know, he's clearly lying. And on some level, he's papered it over so that he pretends to think that he isn't. But deep down, it's such an open and shut case. And I just wonder, when he's 50, you know, is he going to be doing the Tawana Brawley and claiming in front of audiences that something happened to me, you know, implying that maybe some of it was fabricated a little, but that he was basing it on something real? Is he just going to admit it? Is he going to start using drugs and die at 45? Fascinating figure to make something like that up that that's stupid and then to have it all fall apart and to pretend that he actually was telling the truth. But it's one of those things with him. Yeah, I remember the interview with Robin Roberts where he said, I fought the fuck back. Like he's trying to. Yeah, that's exactly right. Tough. And then he had another speech. This didn't get as much around. He was addressing some group in Los Angeles and he was comparing himself to Tupac and and he was reading from note cards. He's, he's story, the he's gay saying, Tupac. Isn't that what he said? Something like that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and he's reading from cards. And it's like, can't you just get up and say something? It's like, even then, he has to read it from cards because it's not real and he wants to keep himself honest to the story that he's he's told. But yeah, that, that's, that was a beautiful example of something. I mean, it's before also the great awakening of May, June 2020, because it was a year before that, yeah. where he thought, and you can actually, it makes sense. Talk about art. You could have him in a miniseries. David Simon should create a Jesse Smollett when he does a show about basically what happened in 2020, where he clearly thought that he would be more interesting and more influential and maybe up his salary on Empire to be the victim of a hate crime than just to be probably one of the most interesting performers on a show that was talked about quite a bit. I mean, on Empire, Taraji Henson, you know, walked away with it. But after you were finished thinking about her, you thought about him and that interesting, rather pioneering character. This she played black, the cookie. Black Is that who? gay hip hopper. Yeah. And he's he's the son. Then there, there's the other son who's kind of more thuggy. Yeah. And then there's him. And he is this very interesting character. I remember people telling me to watch Empire, and usually it was mostly because of that thread. And he was doing a very good job on the show. I, I watched about the first two seasons of it, then I got enough. But that wasn't enough. He wanted to be the victim of a hate crime because he knew that would make him look very, very cool. And then he tries to play it, but apparently he doesn't concentrate hard enough to come up with a plausible story. And now here he is, you know, pretending that, that quote unquote, something happened to him. You know, his Twitter is still, all I want to do is save the world. And you know, he wants to be this preacher. You could see that in him before. His Twitter was a little little preachy for somebody in their 30s. It's like he wanted to be some kind of elder. He comes from actual civil rights heroes. And you can tell that his he father wants, is white. He went right, but his mother's not. And he yeah. wants to keep he wants to keep it going. But he lives in these times when it's harder to do that than it used to be because the issues are more abstract. And so he ends up making something up. He is such a totem of how hard it can be to be black and do the right thing and make sense in our post-civil rights era, and particularly the 21st century. You just knew somebody was going to pull something like that, and he did. Well, your question, how does he live with this five years out, 10, 20 years out? Does he stick by his guns and insist that he's been victimized and that the Chicago police framed him? Or does at some point he say, look at, okay, you know, we all make mistakes and you I know, was I'm young, put this one behind me and mm-hmm. whatever. And I have no way of knowing uh, what he will do. I can see the attractiveness of sticking by one's guns in that there will be, just as there are people who believe hands up, don't shoot about Michael Brown and people who believe that Trayvon Martin really was hunted down and murdered by a vicious, et cetera. Uh, I, you know, they're going to be people who are going to believe Jesse. If Jesse says it happened, don't you, who are you going to believe me or the Chicago police department? In fact, I believe a black lives matter spokesperson in LA is quoted in the newspaper as having said, uh, Jesse Smollett is uh, on our side fighting for justice for black people. The Chicago police department are SOBs. I'll believe him over them any day of the week. He's my guy. So, you know, 10% or whatever of the world is going to stick by him no matter what. That's, that's a few people, and, you know, he could stick by his guns. Um, the other thing that interests me is this interrelationship between reality and fiction. I believe you're right. He reckoned that as a victim of a racist attack, his cachet as an actor would be enhanced. 
Perhaps those who write the script for Empire would find space for more words and more time on screen for the Jesse Smollett who had been victimized by racist MAGA hat wearing, uh, you know, uh, thugs uh, than the Jesse Smollett who was just a guy who, with a pretty good voice and uh, who's a pretty good actor who was playing a part. They, they could elevate him in the series if indeed he were the victim of this hate crime. I mean, so the two things kind of merged together. But since it was a hoax, it means that the fiction part is on both sides of the line. <laughs> the, the, the fiction part is on what's going on in the scripted TV show. And the fiction part is on how I'm carrying myself in the world. And I, I can manufacture the script on either side of that line. And they interact with each other favorably. Uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's funny. I'm thinking now, you can guess that the career maybe had gone about as far as it was going to go. He maybe felt like there wasn't going to be more because, you know, he was he was good. But nobody was talking about him as an utter phenomenon. This maybe would have put him over the edge. What really gets me about the response to him, though, is something where I get frustrated because, as you know, I'm always trying to imagine what it's like to be somebody else. I try so hard to put myself into somebody else's head because I, my working hypothesis is that everybody makes sense. But there are times when I just can't do it. And one of them is that initial response to him from from you know, intelligent people. Because when that story first broke, I remember thinking, I wasn't as cynical even then, three years ago, two, two years ago. Two years ago. As I am now. I mean, based on the, the Trayvon, Michael Brown, I've said to you that it's at the point where whenever I hear about any of these cases, I think we don't know everything because it's going to be completely different from what we've heard. Like Ahmaud Arbery, it's a little bit more, but none of which obscures the basic hideous injustice that he suffered. That's the exception where it isn't that everything just breaks down completely. With Jacob Blake, it's nothing like what we're being told, for example. Whereas with, with Smollett, I was not that cynical yet. But frankly, the story is so stupid. You know, he, It's two o'clock in the morning. It's 15 degrees. There are these supposed two white guys. They watch Empire. They know who Jesse Smollett is. They're waiting for him. Or even if it's not that they're waiting for him and would recognize him, which they wouldn't, especially if he's all hooded up. Who are they waiting for at two o'clock in the morning in those temperatures to do these things to with this equipment on them? What kind of human behavior is that? As soon as that came out, I thought, as I had seen Smollett's Twitter feed for a random reason, I thought, wait a minute, is this real? Because you can see a certain melodramatic, self-dramatizing quality in this person. And I just tabled it. I didn't think about it that much, but I thought something's wrong with that. Did none of those people, there's no way they couldn't have seen it. But Glenn, this is the thing. Those people sincerely believe that something like that could happen. They actually think that racism is still so bad. I'm not going to speak for homophobia, but racism is so bad that that story could be plausible. I don't think they're acting. And so a lot of what frustrates us, I often say that these people are striking a pose because it's part of this religion. But I have to understand that to an extent, they mean it. They actually think that could happen. They think it's 1950. And I don't quite know why, except that it's that they sequester logic off when it comes to race. This is where my religious analysis comes from. Kamala Harris, for example, I'm not trying to dogpile on her, but how could she believe Go that? Go ahead. <laughs> how could she possibly <laughs> well, think? Well, that just that consider happen? that maybe she didn't really believe it, but that her response of the sort that she gave, oh, poor Jesse, a victim of a modern day lynching, uh, we're with you, solidarity, white supremacy must be stopped, is a part of the act. It, 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 it is in itself as much of a pose as was the original- It must be. As was the original fraudulent representation that came from Jesse Smollett. That reaction is pro forma. It is, uh, you could teach a machine to give it. It could have been a bot writing these tweets, any black person victimized must be celebrated as a latter day instance of the Emmett Till lynching, because that's the America that we live in. I mean, there was so much implausible about the story. It's not even funny. MAGA hat wearing Trump supporters in Central City, Chicago. Two white guys at 2 a.m. Do you know what's going on in the streets <laughs> What are of they Chicago? doing there? Wearing MAGA hats? They wouldn't last a minute. <laughs> There's, they're roaming gangs of uh, <laughs> black teenagers on the streets of Chicago. That's what the retailers, the hoteliers, 
and and the restaurant tours are complaining about <laughs> nobody wants to go downtown Chicago at 2 a.m. <laughs> because uh, uh, it's not a particularly hospitable environment for Trump supporters in a precinct that probably went 98 uh, percent for uh, uh, Joseph Biden in 2020, 98 percent for Hillary Clinton in 2016. So. Uh, what did the, the Dave Chappelle? He calls him Dave Chappelle. Has a whole routine on this thing. He calls him Juicy Smollier. That he he Juicy. makes fun of his name, Juicy. Yeah. This Dave Chappelle. He says <laughs> he says uh, black people. And this is ordinary black people, not black people who run for office and who have to engage in the polls. This is commonsensical black people who work for a living and who live on the south side of Chicago or the east side of Detroit or whatever. Didn't believe that nigga for a minute. Is what Dave Chappelle said because it was entirely. <laughs> And he, he waits with a noose around his neck for the police to come. They put a noose on me. They put a noose that on me. That was one of the dumbest things. Why they didn't you poured, take it off? They poured bleach yeah. on me. What What was the... they armed with bleach? They're walking around with bleach waiting for somebody? <laughs> and, and because they wouldn't be waiting, it means they came for him. Why would they care about Jesse Smollett? <laughs> these these guys, it doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't they go after okay, somebody the, else? The police charged him and the courts convicted him after a special prosecutor had to be called in, in part because huge resources of the Chicago Police Department were devoted to investigating this hoax when they could have been deployed to fight the uh, awful crime wave that's going on in the city. But in part because the damage to the social fabric done by the promulgating of such a false tale causing partisan uh, division causing in the extreme people into the streets demonstrating, causing perhaps riot and arson and so forth like that. This is the kind of thing that this fraudulent representation contributes to is, is, a, is a social affront. It, it's, it's a bad thing for us. So he deserves punishment. I, I don't want to say jail time. I'm not the judge. Leniency is not a bad thing. Um, he doesn't have a record. Uh, maybe he could be out on, you know, community service and probation and whatnot. Jail time for a guy like him would be pretty tough. Uh, but he definitely deserves some kind of sanction for uh, this, uh, in my opinion. And you don't, we don't want to be like a certain type on the hard left where there's, within their religion, there's no such thing as forgiveness. I would say that with Smollett, the ideal trajectory of his life would be that he admits it and acknowledges the, you know, what he stirred up, the danger that was involved, and just goes off and becomes a better person. Just explains, I, I made a mistake. I would, I would accept that. I mean, I would, I would so figure would I. that. I would be happy to see him have a career again after a certain grace period. But if he's not going to admit it, if he's going to pull up this, you'll like this. If he's going to do like Al Sharpton with Tawana Brawley and never really apologize for what he did. And as you know, right, you, I do like that you have more of a problem with him than I do, but still that is a mm -hmm. thing I have with him that he has never apologized even, you know, decades later Then no Smollett should never be seen again. He should be washing cars for a living. Um, it's just, yeah, it, it's morally reprehensible what he did. And for him not to admit it is, um, truly unfortunate because yes, it, it had a symbolic value, not to mention that it casts into doubt, what other people might say about actual hate crimes perpetrated against them. It, it makes a certain kind of person skeptical who shouldn't be, but maybe will be. It's poison in, in a society. He did a really crummy, crummy thing. But how do you live with yourself? I'll be interested to see. Um, but yeah, it was a totemic episode. I found it very interesting. At the time. All right. I was reading Andrew Sullivan's newsletter the other day and a linguistic issue was being pursued. This is Sullivan talking about the use of the phrase black and brown. Black and brown people are catching hell. The police are oppressive of black and brown people. Black and brown people don't have the same opportunities. Black and brown. Black and brown people are underrepresented, etc. And he says, this is in so many words, and I wonder what you think about this, that that is a dishonest use of language. And it's an effort to create a coalition of interest where in objective social fact, no such coalition exists, that assimilating black and brown people to a uh, aggregate category of non-whiteness, that is to say, non-white excluding Asians, uh, is, uh, is a dishonest uh, sleight of hand 
uh, in the use of the language, uh, because as a matter of fact, black and brown people are very, very, very uh, different. Uh, and the dynamic of American uh, social demography is moving away from this binary black, white, mid 20th century model and moving towards something much richer, more interesting and more American, which is a, a variety of immigrant groups from places other than Europe, that is from South Asia, from East Asia, uh, from Africa, from the Caribbean uh, and so on, are coming and finding this country to be open free, dynamic, prosperous, and a place where uh, dreams can come true. And to varying degrees and in varying different ways, they are making their way up the ladder and they are insinuating themselves into the center of uh, our uh, economic and political life, as other uh, immigrant groups have done throughout the history of this country, exposing, these are my words, not Andrew Sullivan's, but it's the logic of his argument, exposing in a way the exceptionalism of some of the descendants of slaves who are not doing that, and the people who play with words like black and brown are really trying to avoid the reality of the situation that America is a pretty good and a pretty open society for everybody, not just for European descended people, and that the marginalization of black people has a lot to do with them and not with America. This is, again, my words, not Andrew Sullivan's, but I'll just complete his thought and throw that out there for you, John, to see what you think about it. <laughs> Talk about the falseness of a lot of this. For even you and me to do what we do is to participate in a way of talking about race that pretends that it's 1960. There is a, there is a huge schematization that we indulge in. Foreigners, people born somewhere else, ask me about it all the time. This idea that they're white people. And white people don't like black people, and black people have problems, and there's just a scattering of other people that kind of don't matter. And that was, you know, a useful fiction in 1960, even though it was oversimplified then. But it's funny, with my particular years, I know where this tipped. I'm born in 1965. Roughly, yeah. I was in college in the early 80s. I was in grad school in the late 80s. I remember in the late 80s looking around me and thinking, why is every fourth person Asian? Or, you know, who are all these people from India? And I didn't mean that I had a problem with it, but it was just all of a sudden there were so many. Because in, when I was in college, neither one of those were real categories. And the reason was because the Immigration Act of 1965 happened then. And we don't talk about that as much, but the people's children who started coming after that started going to college in large numbers right around after I went to college and before I went to grad school. That's what that was. And so now we live in a world where there's so many other kinds of people and Latinos outnumber us. And yet we're still talking about this white black thing. And, you know, you adjust by saying black and brown, but increasingly what's going on is that a sliver of Americans who, you know, would be classified as black have a certain set of issues. And then frankly, to a large extent, there's everybody else. And to imagine that there can be a coalition of BIPOC people that never seems quite to have worked. It goes against how basic human tribalism operates and the fact that there will never be a united proletariat in this country of any kind. And it means that there is a falseness about the way we talk about these things. Is a person of South Asian ancestry brown? Physically, they are. Do they suffer discrimination? In some ways, it tends to be differently than black people do, and frankly, usually not as much. And then there's also the fact that they were mostly willing immigrants, you know, all of this, but no, it's Andrew was right. And frankly, Thomas Chatterton Williams and Camille Foster are our colleagues yeah. in their chafing at these racial definitions are correct. I'm not ready to go with them in terms of issues of convenience and tradition. And maybe I, that shows my age, but the way that we think about these things, we are fish who don't know we're wet. It is ridiculous that we have this insistence that Thomas and you and me and Camille and Coleman and Chloe are all this one thing black. And some people might be listening to this and thinking that the deep six answer to this is how the cops treat you. And I say, no, it isn't. That is one of a great many experiences that a person has in life. And the way we talk about it is also extremely distorted. No, the cops do not define blackness. Yeah, we are in 1863 in our notions of what black is. We, it, it, the one drop rule rules, and we somehow think that's okay because of the cops. No, 
And so, yes, it's absurd. I so, know that I live in incoherent times in that. I want to throw a question out there to bracket, and then I want to make a comment. The question is, are we, you and me, Glenn Lowry, the Black Lies at bloggingheadtv too binary in our approach to the race question, talking about black and white too much as if what you just got through saying, and I just got through saying words. So, so that's something that you can react to later. But the, I want first to say you, you're being born in 1965 is uh, uh, an interesting coincidence because that's the year in which the Immigration Reform Act that uh, removed the preference for European immigrants uh, over and against those from non-white countries uh, into the United States was enacted. And everybody knows about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and about the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Well, that Immigration Reform Act of 1965 may have been more important than in terms of the social Definitely. evolution of our country than either of those statutes, as important as those statutes were. Mm -hmm. Because tens of millions of people from non-European ports of origin have come into the United States in the half century plus since that statute was enacted. And their grandchildren are among us. Some of their grandchildren are among us. Uh, Matt Taibbi, the journalist, uh, has a newsletter, and his most recent post is about Loudoun County, Virginia. This mm -hmm. was the site of the school board tussle about the um, father who got charged with a crime because he objected to, he behaved in a, an inappropriate way in a school board meeting, objecting to the rape of his daughter in a by a um, a boy wearing a skirt, quote unquote, in a girl's bathroom in uh, the school somewhere, whatever, whatever. This is uh, Terry McAuliffe losing to Glenn Youngkin in that gubernatorial race because people think a big part of it was fighting about critical race theory in the schools in Loudoun County and so on, a parent rebellion and so on and so forth. And Taibbi's argument is that the national media have completely misreported the reality of what's actually going on in terms of schools in Loudoun County. And here's in my short version of what's actually going on. What's actually going on is that this is the richest, one of the richest areas, or maybe the richest county in the United States. It's one of the top 10 for sure. Um, it has a 20% South Asian population. Uh, a lot of them are techies. The, the, they are working in uh, the uh, high-tech industry. They're kind of like the Silicon Valley of the East Coast or something like that. And they're working for government contract enterprises that require technical skills. A lot of them are immigrants from uh, southern India. That is to say they're dark-skinned. They've come from Bangalore, uh, Hyderabad, which is called Cyberabad by some people because mm. there's so much high tech information stuff that's that's going on uh, around there. These people have come to America. They are not white. I repeat, they are not white. And they don't feel also white. Not black. They don't feel white, mm -hmm. but they are also not black. Uh, they believe in the American dream because it has come true in their lives. Uh, their kids ace the test, just like the Chinese uh, American kids in the New York City exam school situation are acing the test. They ace the test. You want to get rid of good uh, gifted and talented, you have to do it over their dead bodies because gifted and talented is one way that they get their kids into the Thomas Jefferson High School of Science and Technology, which is one way they get their kid into Harvard or Columbia or Penn or Brown to do physics or uh, computer science or whatever it is that they're doing because they are uh, uh, performing uh, the skills required in the 21st century uh, to participate in the modern world. And he says that at the root of it is what uh, the education culture war in Loudoun County is about, whether or not these brown-skinned immigrant believing in America, tech-savvy, excellent student-producing communities are going to have access to the public institutions of education on the basis commensurate with the talents and performative skills that they exhibit at something that's really hard to do, or whether they were going to be victimized by woke equity consultants coming in from California to tell them that they are actually white adjacent uh, uh, exploiters who are oppressing underperforming communities of color and preventing them from having access to the American dream. He says, 
both McAuliffe gets it wrong when he says racist dog whistle about parents who are complaining about the schools. And, and again, they're Trump voting, white supremacist loving, uh, anti-black sentiment that's going on when that's exactly not what was going on. Um, I think Taibbi now is, is on to something really interesting here about both the press who represent these subtle and complicated ethnographic dilemmas in simple black and white terms, uh, but also about the reality of American life uh, here in the 21st century, which is no longer anti-black or pro-white or white supremacist, but which is largely, again, a, a replay in the 21st century of an old story about the dynamism of American society where people come in from the outside. You know, it, it's, it's, meant to, it's said to be a, a microaggression to observe that this is the place that people want to actually come. America's supposed to be so racist. How come so many people from non-white ports of origin are risking everything to get here? America's supposed to have no opportunity, is, according to the ta Coasts of the world, the American dream is a fraud. Then how come so many people are seeing their lives made so much better and the lives of their children made so much better by being able to participate in this society? And again, the arrow points backwards. How come black people are not themselves seizing these opportunities? Very difficult question. A lot that can be said about it. But white supremacy, that, that's a childish, foolish, uh, uh, intellectually infantile, uh, but politically convenient uh, response to the question, why are black people not availing ourselves of the same opportunities that people from every quarter of this world who are not Europeans seem to be able to make the best of. And here is the answer that you would get from certain quarters, especially with the news this week. Have you seen the news, they would ask you, that if you are a black couple, your home is appraised at a lower rate than if you were a socioeconomically equivalent white couple? And we have a case where a black couple found that when they had the appraisal done again and they had a white friend pose as them and took the black photographs out of their home, then I believe that the house was appraised as being $50,000 worth more than when it was, you know, with their faces. And that happened. And we can certainly, we can certainly imagine, we can certainly assume, not imagine, assume that that is a general phenomenon. And that is what some reports have been saying all week, that black owned houses are appraised for less. And that this is an indication of unintended, but important to notice racial bias. So a certain person would say to you, how can you say that white supremacy is not the factor when you still see things like this? That proves it. People are going to do high fives. You know, that shows that racism still exists. And I say, yeah, OK. Now, what is the through line from that phenomenon to black American kids and their relationship to standardized tests? And somebody will say, well, it means that the neighborhoods that black kids grow up in are statistically less X, Y and Z. OK, yeah, yeah. maybe, maybe not ideal. But then with a lot of these immigrants, are all of them living high on the hog? You think about the urban Korean American immigrants who have the corner stores, et cetera. Do you have to be living in a shiny, happy, leafy neighborhood in order for your kids to excel on a standardized test and to go further than you? We don't consider that to even be a question when it comes to anybody but the descendants of African slaves. What's the difference? And so my question would be, yes. An appraiser might decide that a house is 450 instead of 500 when they see a black couple standing outside. Yeah. And, you know, there might be some reasons for that that I'm not aware of that a realtor could tell me about. But let's let's leave that aside. I'm assuming that this is just basic injustice. True. But what does that have to do with whether or not our families take advantage of the ample opportunities that exist here, even if your home is appraised at $50,000 less than it would be otherwise? I'm not sure that our people have an answer to that question. Racism does exist, but it does not explain the discrepancies that we're talking about, nor, I think, do levels of intelligence. And that's why you and I are talking about what you might call culture. culture. And if that's a hot button, then I call it norms. What you grow up thinking of as a norm, that sort of thing can affect trajectory every bit as much as, quote unquote, white supremacy. Yeah, well. As you were talking, I was thinking this does boil down to genetics versus culture. 
because the if it's not white racism, then what is it? It's going to be the retort. If you I say it's racism, says the uh, anti-racist. I say that explains the uh, underrepresentation of blacks. Uh, otherwise, there must be something wrong with black people. That that's the argument. There is nothing wrong with black people. That's the axiom. Therefore, it must be racism. Uh, and you know, there's a certain logic in that. It, there either is or isn't, quote unquote, something about black people that accounts for what's going on. If it isn't something about black people, call that residual category whatever it is, racism, and we're done. On the other hand, if indeed the uh, structure is uh, not to be blamed for the outcome here, then you have to somehow or another uh, find an account that attributes some responsibility to black people ourselves. That could be intrinsic incapacity, genetics, or it could be patterns of behavior, value, and norm that are uh, not as productive of this kind of achievement. They may product be productive other, of other kinds of achievement. Blacks are overrepresented in the arts, for example. Blacks are overrepresented in uh, athletic achievement, for example. Again, that could be genetic or that could be culture. Uh, if Blacks are underrepresented amongst those in the Silicon Valley tech world, again, that could be genetics or that could be culture. We want to rule out genetics a priori. We could have a side conversation about whether or not that's a wise thing to do. I actually don't think it's a wise thing to do, although I do scientifically a wise thing to do, although I do see the political and ethical appeal of taking that stand. But let's bracket that for a minute and let's just suppose it's not, there's no genetic component whatsoever to what it is that we're talking about. Then uh, we're left with culture. Uh, and, and to, people to have say problems that with that. A, and to say that there's a cultural factor for many people is the most heartless and unthinkable thing in the world. I've never completely understood why. I mean, there seems to be this idea that if you're a descendant of African slaves and Jim Crow and redlining, there couldn't be anything counterproductive in your culture that that somehow that's ruled out. I'm not sure where that became a settled question because all pe people, all subcultures have wrinkles and problems. And the fact that you've had a difficult past, even the particular difficult past that we've had, does not somehow cancel that out. And yet, if you talk about culture for many people, you are the most backwards person in the world when it's painfully evident that. The issue is partly this thing called white supremacy, but partly what people come to think of as norms, often because of the historical effects of that white supremacy. But that doesn't mean that that has not affected people's sense of norms. But I to say that, you know, excuse me, to, to say that is considered the height of ignorance. I don't think it is. And I think that no. most, pe most people listening to this understand that. It's just that you're taught to pretend that you don't. Oh, I, I was just going to reiterate. I mean, I, I think the point that culture is not itself. Uh, fixed and exogenous. It's, it's a consequence of history. And so the domination of black people and the effects of white supremacy well may reflect themselves in part in terms of certain cultural patterns uh, and dynamics that are uh, impeding uh, black achievement right now. So the responsibility for culture doesn't fall only on African Americans. It's not an entirely internal uh, argument. Uh, you could say, for example, that out of what like birth, uh, patterns in African-American communities are partly a response to, and then name your structural phenomenon. Going back to slavery, it could be one. The effects of the welfare state and uh, whatnot could be another. Uh, incentives of welfare and whatnot, encouraging single parenthood and whatnot. Uh, I'm not adopting either of those theories as such. I'm just saying they are possible explanations of a cultural pattern. Uh, so the fact of out of what like births as a cultural phenomenon inhibiting Blacks need not only be on the shoulders of black people, it could also be a reflection of larger social forces. But it goes back to Moynihan. Doesn't it go back to the controversy in the 60s about the black family? And uh, I mean, maybe we are not qualified as intellectual historians to give the proper treatment of this. Don't we have to inquire about the general attitude toward cultural argument in American society? That, that is about, for example, sexual norms, you know, where you don't want to, about the nuclear family as an ideal type where people might be a feminism and its rejection of certain norms, the rise of the, uh, the gay rights movement and the uh, transgender movement and whatnot. And again, I'm not taking a position on any of this. I'm just saying, aren't they a part of the larger intellectual framework within which discussions of race and culture um, are taking place? I think so. Um, so 
I don't know. Anyway, John, we've we got an hour under our belt here at the Glenn Show. It's what we usually do in conversation. We'll be back in two weeks. So um, parting words for the audience, John. Buy his think, book, Woke Racism. I think we can say that. Much. I think also the theme would be, and I, I get this from an exchange I had with the sociologist Alana Redstone last week. What is a settled question? You know, it, it, beware arguments where it's assumed that a question has been settled and that we're going to then make our points on the basis of this supposedly settled question. An awful lot of our race debate is based on a proposition that questions are settled that aren't, and it's your job to pretend that they are, because otherwise you're going to get called a white supremacist on Twitter. The questions very often aren't settled. You know, so standardized tests are biased, right? No, wrong. That is not a settled question. Defend it. That sort of thing. That's my <laughs> parting words for this particular session. I, I think that's very interesting. I think that's a very interesting, challenging kind of epistemological question that you put, which is, uh, what are the things that we should set aside as agreed upon and not argue about, not waste our time arguing about? Mm -hmm. uh, the moral, moral status of slavery is one such. Don't, we don't need to talk about we, that. We, we're not going to have a debate about whether or not slavery is okay. We're not right. going to get into we're not African descended people helped by the fact that their ancestors were kidnapped and brought into the new world, et cetera. <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to just we're gonna leave that, that aside. That but right. there are other things that people take to be subtle questions and therefore inhibit you from being able to discuss because they are supposedly subtle, which mm -hmm. are a long way from being actually subtle. And intellectual honesty requires prying open that, that uh, corner of, uh, of our uh, intellectual lives, which some people want to defend as beyond discussion and entering into debate about supposedly settled questions. Precisely. Uh, I like that. I like that way of framing it. Yeah, let's keep that. <laughs> let's keep it up. Thank you, John. Uh, it was a good conversation. We'll talk to you in two weeks. Thank you, Glenn. See you soon. Bye.